London, the year 2023, and leather-clad renegade Nero Costa is on the run. With the police now able to detect wrongdoing before it's happened by accessing our brains over Wi-Fi for signs of thought crime, police are able to apprehend so-called plea criminals without trial. My character, Nero Costa, is wanted for the murder of a politician he is yet to even meet. Viva la revolution! Oh -ho -ho! The stuff there of some dystopian sci-fi movie, currently seeking seed finance and a distributor. In real life, though, with the thought police confined to the Guardian's comment pages, we rely on mass imprisonment to curb crime. But some criminal justice campaigners even take issue with that. Why? Well, in 1971, researchers at Stanford University conducted a prison experiment in which volunteers were given roles as inmates or guards. Within days, the guards had become sadistic and cruel, the prisoners servile and weak, a power dynamic familiar to anyone who stayed with their wife's parents at Christmas. I have personal experience of the kind of damage the Stanford experiment can cause. In 2004, I'm ashamed to say that I took part in a Channel 4 rehash named Loose Screws. If you ever want to see your kids again, you better start showing some respect! Right, who's next? The series was never broadcast. Where's Vernon? Academics pour scorn on our prisons from the comfort of their leather big chairs. But how many have ever been in a prison? None. Whereas I've come to sample a bit of porridge first-hand. Not the kind I have for breakfast. Organic oats, linseed, sliced nana, all washed down with piping hot coffee and my tablets. But the kind... It's Alan Partridge, I've got permission. But the kind of porridge served at Her Majesty's pleasure, but the only piping hot coffee is the hot coffee thrown in your face by a troubled teenager with a rubbish dad. That's right. Borstal. Tissue, item, semi-used, access key, insignia with leather toggle. Chicken shop wet wipes, five units. I didn't want to go to a men's prison, but seeing as the women's prison didn't get back to me, I would be incarcerated here in a youth offenders institute. For the homeless. And the gloves? Why? To kick off, I spent what seemed like an hour with prison governor Morris Pelt. It's about carrots and stick, isn't it? Uh, although you can hit people with a carrot. He said the boys nicknamed him Strange Ways because he used to work there. But I'll let you be the judge. When these young lads walk through these doors and become inmates, I stand them where you are now and I say, what? You blew it, kid. I say, forget what might have been. Three words, Alan. Three words that are banned in my office. Shoulda, woulda. Coulda, shoulda done this, shoulda done that. You didn't. Coulda done this, coulda done that. You didn't. Woulda done this, woulda done that. You didn't. No, you didn't. I liked Morris. His inspirational shtick could be a little preachy, honed by Sunday morning spent as a Christian minister. But if he thinks we have a soul inside us, like some sort of holy spleen, where's the harm in that? Because you know what the prize is, huh? It's the future. What's the prize? The future. Wrong, no. Not the future, a future. There's a boy's eye. Because changing direction is a choice. But whose choice? Mine. It slowly dawned on me Yours. Morris was asking questions he knew he and I both knew what the answers to, to, which felt like cheating. Past then again, although a bit you. simplistic for Where the likes it? of me, Where is behind it? you. It was perfect for daft lads. Target is an Al Qaeda cell. Four terrorists are in the building. In addition, they have as many as four hostages. Your mission is to recover the hostages. We're in two teams. A team led by Danny will secure the perimeter. B team today will include Alan. Lads. B team will enter the building through the door on the white aspect. The hostages are being held on the far side of the blue aspect. Any questions? Sir. Alan. Recommend we use night vision capability. It's 1300 hours, so no. Copy that. Questions? I've got the rear! Open door left! With me! Open left! I've got the rear! Open door right! Help me! I've got the rear! Special Forces experts agree it's important to guard the rear. Partridge, with me! This was my signal. A gauntlet thrown down. We know eagles dare. But does a partridge? Left 
side clear, right side clear, room clear, hold. Did you see that? Did you see that? Yes, mate. So, how do you think you did? Pretty good, yeah, pretty good. Well, you discharged your firearm correctly, all neat and tidy. Yeah, I was a sixer in the Cubs. Right, well, let's have a look at the video, shall we? Yeah, this this fourth shot, what's this stance? You, you're presenting a very wide target. Yeah, that's a, that's a recognised shooting stance. Where have you seen that before? Uh, the opening sequence of the James Bond films. <laughs> right, yeah. It's me and the boys are wondering where the hell's he got that from? Yeah, I told you, it's been the opening sequence of the James Bond films. Yeah. And straight away, I can see a fundamental problem. Your first two shots. Uh, yeah, double tap, central torso, pretty good. You've killed a hostage. Oh, Alan. Terrorist, unharmed. Hostage, dead. Terrorist, unharmed. Hostage, dead. Terrorist, unharmed. Hostage, dead. That makes four unharmed terrorists yeah. and four hostages yeah. killed. That is suboptimal. We would call it a catastrophic failure. I mean, why did you shoot this guy? This is an Islamic terrorist cell. This guy's clearly a Sikh. Oh, come on. I mean... Do you know many Muslims that wear turbans? Sinbad the sailor. Catastrophic failure. Well, well wait a second. I was charged with incapacitating four targets and recovering four persons, which, to be fair, I did do. The only twist was... That you save four terrorists and kill four hostages. Precisely. I mean, that, that's a good shot. Quiz. One of these people spent World War II sewing uniforms, the other flying Spitfires. So, which was which? The answer will surprise you. The seamstress, this man, who got into sewing rather than fighting because he was severely mollycoddled by his mother and, sadly, the poor chap ended up as a softie. The Spitfire pilot, a woman, Eleanor Hartley, who defied convention to help transport military aircraft to wherever it was needed. Because it's an irrefutable fact that without the role played by women in almost every sphere in both civil and military life, the Second World War would have been slightly harder to win. Today, Eleanor is 94 and has very kindly agreed to join us here at Goodwood Aerodrome to return to the wonderful machines that she once flew. Eleanor, thank you so much for joining us. It's lovely to be here. A wonderful, wonderful woman to whom we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude. In the end, though, her interview was largely unusable. Heavy frost this morning. Mm -hmm. To learn more, I spoke to a man much better versed in Spitfire history. Good morning. My name's Alan. Roger. And your name? Roger. Oh, sorry, I thought you were agreeing with me. No, just telling you my name. Oh, I see. Right. Well, I'm Alan Partridge. Roger that. Right. And uh, your full name? That. Is your name, don't say anything, is your name Roger that? It turns out the airman, a bit of a character with a love of wordplay, is actually called Paul Wheeler. But he pretends to be called Roger that to bamboozle new trainees. He has also just, appeared uh, on Countdown. I really didn't do jokes like that because I'm a journalist. Now, Eleanor here, one of the few people left alive who understands what it was like to fly the Spitfire and, and carry that huge responsibility. What was it like, do you think, for people like Eleanor to carry such huge responsibility? Well, I don't, I don't think anyone was in any doubt as to how integral Spitfire was to the war effort. I suppose the only way to truly understand the sacrifice made by Eleanor and people like her is for me to put myself in their shoes. So if the plane gets into trouble, there's no ejector seat, so you'll have to bail out. Why would the plane get into trouble? Oh, we just have to give you the bailout procedure. OK. So if the pilot says, jump, 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 you lower the seat, you unlatch the canopy, you unplug the radio, open the door, jump away from the plane, and deploy your parachute by pulling the D-ring. D-ring? No, D-ring. Yes, of course. Now, if you land in water... Oh, hang, hang on, hang on. Say it again? Yes, again. Lower the seat, unlatch seat. the canopy, canopy, unplug the radio... Why not do that bit? Well, you need to do that bit, otherwise you'll be tethered to the plane and pulled down to earth with it. OK, I'll definitely do that then. I'll just uh, asterisk the important ones. Well, they were all important. Yeah, I'll asterisk all of them then. And after a handful of toilet trips, which I'm told is perfectly normal, it was time to spread my wings like the arms of a bird and take off. Does this say latch or cat? Can't look right now, sorry. Can you radio and ask someone? Not right now. OK, but soon. 
I was quickly lost in admiration for this plucky little aeroplane, and it was a privilege to climb heavenwards until I was touching the face of God with the very tip of my nose. Up here you can be proud to be British, and uh, no left-wing people can touch at you. No one to admonish you by having a certain point of view. No one accusing you of culturally appropriating a Moroccan because you're wearing a fez. Even though you've only gone as Tommy Cooper. Sometimes wonder why we bothered winning the war.